Well, happy Mother's Day. Thank you to our moms and really all the women who make a difference in our lives. We hope that this day is special and that you feel celebrated during this season. Now, before we begin worship, I wanted to invite you to powwow, which is gonna be happening this Saturday morning at St. Mark. See, for only $12, you can get up to 70 pounds of fresh produce. And also, they're gonna have it all set up where it's safe and clean. You'll simply drive up and you don't even have to get out of your car. And then volunteers are gonna be wearing masks and gloves and are going to place it in your trunk. Now, speaking of volunteers, become one. Come help out and serve our community this Saturday. You know, another way to serve others is by making masks. See, if you have the gift of sewing, then use that gift to make masks for our new drive, our new collection that we're doing. See, this week we're opening up small groups to begin meeting in person, and one day we're gonna be able to come together and worship in person. And in doing so, we wanna have masks available for anyone who wants one. And then if we have extras, we can donate it to our community. And that's what it's all about, our church. You guys have demonstrated generosity this season. See, last week we encouraged you to donate food, and guess what? We collected over 150 pounds for the Paradise Valley Food Bank, and then also we sent three boxes to the sisters at Canaan in the Desert. Now you can find out more info about Pow Wow and our new mass collection drive at stmarkphx.org. And while you're there, fill out that digital welcome card, submit a prayer request, plus you can also find children and family devotions and a place to give online. Finally, please like, comment, and subscribe to this YouTube video so that you can stay connected with this all week. And also consider sharing this with a friend, either on social media or simply copying the link and texting or emailing it to someone. Now, as we begin worship and a message from God's word, may you receive strength and comfort from God who loves you. Thanks again for joining us. Well, happy Mother's Day. You know, this Mother's Day, things are looking a little bit different because of all the things that are going on. And I can't help but think of my mom and my grandma during this time who haven't been able to see their kids, their grandkids, and their great-grandkids. You know, I've always known that they've loved us, but through this time of distancing, me and my siblings have really been able to see just how much they miss our kids and miss us and how sad it makes them just to have this distance between them. And as we're here for worship today, isn't that the same with God? You know, we know that God loves us, but if we don't spend time with him in his word and in prayer, we don't get to experience the fullness of that love. And so today as we begin, let's go to God in a time of prayer as we confess our sins. Let's pray. Father God, when the busyness of life erodes our intentions, when our personal desires overtake reaching out to others, when we put off being more active doers of the word, Father God, we ask for your forgiveness. Hear us now as we come to you in a time of silent confession. Gracious and merciful God, forgive us for our past faults and help us in the present and in the future to make ourselves more available to the hurting world that surrounds us. Father God, it's the world that begins on our doorsteps. Equip us to be patient and compassionate listeners, proclaiming the gospel, not in overbearing ways, but in sensitive and loving ways. Father God, strengthen us with the Holy Spirit to be fruitful and active witnesses to Jesus Christ in all that we do and say. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. And I love this verse from Romans 5. It says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Because of God's great love for us, we have been forgiven, forgiven in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. for this day we've gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like 
like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates the mighty river Let's 
Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy, where are you going? sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy. Mommy! Where are you? But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you would speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... You know, seeing all these flowers here today for Mother's Day sort of reminds me of a, a Memorial Day message that I heard one time. In, in it, he used an illustration about a little kid that came and he sat down in service and he saw all the flowers that were before him and he said, Dad, Dad, where are all the flowers for? And his dad said, those are in honor of all the people who died in service, son. But the boy got this really frightened look on his face and, and, and with fear in his eyes, he said, Dad, was it the 8 o'clock or 9.30 service? <laughs> I love that. Anyways, today we're celebrating Mother's Day 2020 coronavirus style. That's why you're at your homes and I'm here talking to Mike. And so, to help moms all over our country today, along with the rest of us who are struggling with this, being shut in, and all kinds of stuff, we're starting a sermon series today that we're calling No Fear. Now, why is it called No Fear? Because there are two ways to live life. One is through the lens of faith and trust. In fact, peace comes from trusting God. And the other is through the lens of fear, which comes as a result of not trusting God. And it seems as of late we've sort of had a, an opportunity, or a lot of practice at least, in bouncing back and forth between the two extremes. So the goal of this series is to give our moms, along with everybody else, a, a genuine sense of peace. Peace in the midst of the storms that we find ourselves in in this life. In fact, as a way of sort of connecting this again to what happened on Easter just a few weeks ago, do you remember what were the first words that the angels said, to Je said after Jesus rose from the dead? What were they? The words were, don't be afraid. And what were the first words that Jesus said after he rose again from the dead? Don't be afraid. And what were the first words that the disciples heard Jesus say when he met them again as a group in that upper room? That's right. Don't be afraid. And you know what? 2,000 years later, that's some still some pretty relevant messaging for us in our lives today. 
In fact, if we were to have a, a giant scream up here behind me and we were to, able to project all the hidden fears that we're struggling with right now, what do you suppose to be on that screen? I mean, if we were to be real just for a second, I think some of you would say, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job in the next coming weeks or months. Some of you are afraid that you're going to lose your marriage. Some of you are afraid you're going to lose your kid because of all the things that are going on in his life or her life and the wrong direction they seem to be taking. Some of you are fearful about your health. You're waiting on test results even now and you fear that C word. Coronavirus or, let's just be honest, way worse, cancer. Some of you are afraid your kids will never be able to go back to school again. I've heard that just from my neighbor the other day. Some of your kids are afraid they will have to go back to school again. Pastor's son uh, once asked him, Daddy, are you afraid of spiders? Oh, no, I'm not afraid of spiders, son. Are, are you afraid of thunder? No. Ghosts? No. Robbers? No. Huh. I guess the only thing you're afraid of is mommy. <laughs> it's interesting. But we call this fear thing by many different names, don't we? We call it worry or, or tension. We call it anxiety, being uptight, stress. One recent study did a study of over 500 different people, and they discovered over 7,000 different fears in those 500 people. That's an average of 14 different fears per person. All that to say is that this is not some minor issue that God and Jesus and the angels and the apostles are talking about when they say, don't be afraid. To be honest, it's at the very core of our existence. And it's been at the very core of what we've been going through over the last several weeks and months with this coronavirus thing. And so we're beginning a new series today about overcoming our fears. And to kick it off, we're going to spend some time today just taking a look at the foundation for no fear living. And this is super important, right? Because everything that we're going to experience in, in the next few weeks, everything that we're going to talk about in the next nine weeks together, None of it's going to matter if you don't get this first part down. Because this is the core. This is the bottom line. What does this foundation of no fear of living look like? Scripture says it looks like three things. So foundation point number one. We need to learn to receive, and maybe that's not a strong enough word. We need to learn to trust God's love for me, for you. In 1 John 4, 18, Jesus says these words. He says, where God's love is, there is no fear because God's perfect love drives out fear. I want you to think about that for a second. I mean, what does that actually look like? I was doing a study, actually, this week and, and discovered that there are three different kinds of fears that, that you and I can have as we go through life. And, and the first is what I'll call surface fears. Surface fears are things like, I don't know, you're, you're afraid you're gonna be, not going to be able to pay your bills, or you're afraid you're going to run out of gas on the freeway, or you're afraid you're going to run out of toilet paper before you, know, you ever find it in the grocery store again. And those are all surface-level fears, and those are all surface-level fears because, ultimately, they're really not that important in the big scope of life. Though maybe you could debate the toilet paper issue, I don't know. But the next level of fears below that are something a lot more significant and, and far more unsettling. These are the subconscious fears. They are the things that are right below the surface. And they're a lot deeper, like the fear of failure or the fear of rejection or the fear of abandonment, the fear of losing control, the fear of being found out, the fear of not being adequate enough for the task at hand. And these can be terrifying. But to be honest, those aren't even your deepest fears because there's a deep level of fear that I'll call the soul fear, and it's singular. And it's the tap root that all your other fears come out of. It's the source. It's the well. And no matter how much you try to get rid of all these other fears in your life, until you deal with this tap root, it's just not going to work. Until you get healing at the deepest level in your life, you're going to still have problems with all these other surface fears. So God says for you to finally deal with your fears that you have in life, you need to heal this part of your life first. So what is it? What is my deepest need, according to Scripture? Well, it might surprise you, actually, but the psychologists agree. And, and the psychologists tell us that our deepest need in life is to feel absolutely, totally, unconditionally loved. 
to feel completely loved. Not for something that you could be, not for something that you should be, but for being loved, right? Just as who you are. And that is our deepest inner need. And that's why God says that perfect love casts out fear. But until this issue is resolved in your life, you're going to be tormented by the other fears. And so here's the truth. Only God can love you with as much love as you really need. Only he can do it. Because God doesn't love you randomly. He loves you consistently. He loves you every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month of the year. Fact is, there's never been a time in your life when God didn't love you. And it's simply not true with everybody else in our life. But again, and this is so important to understand, only God can love you as deeply as you really need to feel. So the first step in achieving no fear living is to actually receive, to actually trust God's love for you. Because where God's love is, there is no fear. Maybe you're thinking, oh, pastor, you don't know what I've done. I, I've blown it too much. In fact, Mike was talking about one of his friends. And he said in this conversation, his friend said, I guess he was a soldier at one point, and he says, you know, I've just done things that not even God can forgive. And people say that over and over. I've blown it too much. God could never love me the way that you're talking about. But that's simply not true. That, that's not God talking. For the Bible says stuff like this, nothing in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That means nothing. God has never stopped loving you. It doesn't mean he approves of everything that you've done. He absolutely does not approve of everything that you've done. But it does mean this. It does mean that he's never stopped loving you. So our job, step one, is just to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for not giving up on me. And to receive that love in your life, right, in a real way, in a tangible way, in a way that makes a difference in the way you move forward, in the way where you care more about what God thinks than what everybody else thinks, in a way that you know that God's got your back and is with you all every step of the way, in a way that lets you know that God's got you in the midst of the storms of life, in the midst of the obstacles and challenges that you're facing, in the way that you just know he's there for you. But he builds on that, and there's a foundation point, number two, I'll talk about. And that's how we need to learn to believe, and again, I'll use that word trust, that Christ died and rose for me. Now, I want you to notice the word me in that sentence. Not that he just died and rose, but that he died and rose for me, you know, for you. Because it's one thing to believe about something, isn't it? And it's quite another to believe in something. I mean, it's one thing to believe about a person. It's another thing to believe in a person. For example, I believe about President Xi of China. I've read about him. I've actually studied parts of his life. I've heard him speak. But I don't believe in President Xi of China. Why? I don't believe in what he's doing. I don't believe in what he's trying to accomplish. I don't believe in some of the things that he's trying to do in China. But similarly, I'll hear people say stuff like this. I believe that there's a God. And that's awesome. I love that you do. And it's really an amazing thing. But is that really the big deal in Christianity? I mean, do you think that that puts you in the book of life because you believe that there's a God? Scripture's answer to that? A resounding no. In fact, the Bible says that only a fool says there's no God. Only a fool. And so it's probably not much of a surprise when I tell you that the Bible says that the devil knows who God is. Actually hung out with God a lot before the fall. Understands who God is. Understands what he's trying to accomplish. Is intimidated by who God is because of the wrath of God. Because of the consequence of God. Because of the, his future with God. But what's really interesting is that even with all that knowledge about who God is, you're still not going to find him in heaven. Why? Because this faith thing is ultimately about more than just head knowledge. It's not just about believing about. It's about believing in. Really, that's what tripped up Satan at the beginning, isn't it? He knew all about God, experienced his grandeur, was one of his right-hand angels. But ultimately, when push came to shove, he just didn't believe in what God was trying to accomplish. He didn't trust in God enough to know that he was working things for his good as well. 
See, the Greek word for believe means to trust and to cling to, to rely on, to adhere to, to sell out to, to commit to. So I could say I believe about Lenin, but that doesn't make me a communist. And I could say I believe about Hitler, read a lot about him in school, but that would not make me a Nazi. But when I say I believe in Jesus Christ, it makes me to my very core a Christian. Why? Because I've committed myself to him. It's sort of be like taking a hot air balloon across Lake Michigan. You might say, I believe that this hot air balloon will get me to the other side. You might say it with all the conviction in your heart. But it's still one thing to say you believe it could happen. And it's quite another thing to get on board. Because the moment you set out over those waters, that's where the real belief, the real trust occurs. I think one of my favorite stories with this is a guy about a guy named George Blondin. And he was a tightrope walker way back in the day. And one of his biggest events of his life is he walked across the Niagara Falls. And so one morning after he publicized it, and there's huge crowds on both the Canadian side and American side, he, he had this, this rope tied from one end to the other. And just to, and the reason all everybody was there is he began walking across from the American side to the Canadian side. And he walked all the way across those falls. And the crowd just went nuts. They couldn't believe it. It was amazing. They were so excited. And then he did the craziest thing. He did it again. He walked back to the American side. And then he, as he got back to the American side, he picked up a wheelbarrow and he walked across to the Canadian side. And the crowd just went nuts even more. Then he filled it with dirt and he walked across back to the American side. And the crowd went even more nuts. And then he filled it with rocks on top of that and he walked it back to the Canadian side. The crowd was just going out of their mind. He did this four or five different times. And finally, on his last trip, one of the spectators says, man, you are amazing. I bet you could do this all day. It's incredible what you're doing. He says, really? He says, yeah, from the very core of my heart, I believe you could do this all day. So Bonin dumped out the rocks and the dirt, and he said, all right, get in. It's one thing to say you believe. It's quite another to get in that wheelbarrow. Jesus says, if you want to walk on water, at some point, you've got to get out of the boat. But maybe you're still thinking about all this and you're still on the fence and with all this and you're wondering, okay, Pastor, if I really believe, I mean, if I really trust in Jesus, what difference does it really make in my life? Well, I think there's a lot of things, but one of them is certainly this. If you believe in Jesus and you believe in what he says about the future is true and you believe about salvation and you believe about forgiveness, then one of the first things that you can stop being afraid of is death. Uh-oh, said the D word. And I know people in our culture, they don't like the D word. They don't like to talk much about death at all, do they? And perhaps especially, is this true today? I mean, they don't like to think about death. They don't even like the word death, to be honest. Why? One of the the biggest realities seems to be is that they don't really know what's going to happen afterwards. And it's terrifying to them. And to be honest, it should be. A pastor was out doing some street witnessing one time, and he went up to a bum and says, hey, do you want to go to heaven? The guy said, oh, no, I do not. The pastor says, what? Don't you want to go to heaven? And again, the bum says, no, I don't want to go. The pastor said, why? Oh, oh," the bum said, never mind. I thought you were taking a busload right now, and I didn't want to go right now. But people are afraid of death. They can't control it, but they know it's coming. And by and large, they are terrified in our culture as a result. But do you know what the real answer is to overcoming this fear? It's Jesus. You just need Jesus in your life. You need to have a relationship with God who loves you, not because you're going to die tonight, because you're probably not. But you need Jesus in your life because you're going to live tomorrow and because you're going to die someday. I mean, that's why Scripture says only a fool goes through life unprepared for what he knows is eventual. That's foolish, God says. So he says, be prepared. Trust in this reality that Jesus died and rose again for you. For the Bible says, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. And I guarantee you, if you believe, if you would trust that promise, if you truly trust in God, you will not be disappointed by the love and the care and the strength and the comfort and the forgiveness and the hope that you will experience as a result of actually trusting Him with your life. 
was thinking about an example, trying to, to bear this across. And I was in a Bible study one time, and we were talking about death. And, and I just shared with the Bible study, I said, you know, just to be honest, I can't wait to go be with God in heaven. I, I can't wait. I'd go today if you would let me. But, but I know as long as he's got me here, it's because he has purpose for my life. I'm a little nervous, to be honest, about how I would go, but I, I can't wait to go be with Jesus. And, and I'll tell you, that wasn't something that came right away with me. I, there was a long period of time where, man, the, the thing that kept me from saying that is my family, my, my, my wife and my kids. And I was worried about, you know, what would happen to them if I would just go be with Jesus but somewhere down along the line, I began to just trust that if my purpose was complete on earth, if God was ready to take me home, that he also had a plan for my kids and a plan for my wife, and that he would protect them just like I would protect them. And so that gave me a peace, and, and today I can't tell you how excited I am to go be with him. Now, it doesn't mean I get to short-circuit his purpose for my life. It doesn't mean suicide's okay, right, at all. But it just means I'm ready. Now, I shared this with the Bible study, and, and I got some pushback, as you'd imagine. And some of them would say, well, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to go. I just don't want to go today. And I'd say, why? What's holding you back? And the answer to that question is because there's something in this life that's rivaling your love for the Lord, that's become so important to you that it's rivaling that number one spot with you and the Lord. And either it's a lack of trust or a lack of priority. But it keeps you in this state of fear, which just leads to the third point. We need to learn to commit our fears and our lives to Christ. Let me give you a quick survey. How many of you would say, I try to follow the Ten Commandments? I'm just imagining all of you have both your hands up. It's incredible how faithful you are. Next question, how many of you know the Ten Commandments? I'll admit that might be a fewer, a little bit fewer of you, but I'm imagining all your hands are still up. Next question, how many of you could recite the Ten Commandments? Okay, put your hands back up. Okay, and maybe not as many of us know this. We know where to go and maybe find it in Scripture. The other day, my daughter recited the Ten Commandments to me because she's going through confirmation. She was so proud. I was so proud. But how about this? How many of you have seen the movie Ten Commandments? Okay, all your hands went back up. That's fantastic. So just let me ask you this, as the knowledgeable bunch of people that you are, do you know what the first commandment is? Well, sure, it's this. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the first one. It's the number one on God's Big Ten list. No other gods. The Bible, in fact, calls breaking this sin the sin of idolatry. And idolatry occurs any time you put anything, any person, any career, any job, any decision, anything in the first spot in your life instead of God. That's what God calls idolatry. It may even be a good thing that you're committed to. But if it's in the first place spot in your life where God ought to be, you've made it a God. And so it quickly turns into a very bad thing as a result. And so, for example, some of you, it might mean that your God, right, that your car might be your God or your house might be your God or your job or your bank account or your girlfriend or your spouse or how about this one, your kids. But if so, that's called idolatry. Anytime you let this happen, you're, you're setting yourself up for fear because you weren't made to live that way. Because anytime you make anything else besides God and it becomes the most important thing in your life, you realize suddenly that it can be taken away from you. And as you do, you develop fear. It's one of the reasons people fear death the way they do. And so if getting people's approval is the most important thing in your life, then you'll develop a fear of losing the approval of other people. And if making money is the number one goal in your life, then you'll develop this fear of losing it all. And if getting married is the most important thing in your life, then you'll have a fear of, of never getting married or, or losing your spouse. If success is the most important thing in your life, you develop a fear of failure. If reputation is the most important thing in your life, you'll develop a fear of losing it all. And you'll have to work on it constantly to maintain your image. Idolatry always equals fear. And so think about what is it that makes you afraid today? And then ask yourself, is there any chance that the issue could be something that's competing with God in my life for that number one slot? If so, that's why you're afraid. 
Fear is always the result of not trusting God, of not trusting in his promises, of not trusting that he's got us, that he's for us, that he loves us. For the reality is that God has created in each of us a God-shaped vacuum. And the deal is if you don't fill it with God, it fills with fear every single time. And then you start wondering why you're so stressed out, why you worry like you do, why you're so uptight all the time. Why things just don't seem to be going according to plan. The reason for that is, is because nothing else can substitute for God. It doesn't matter how much human affirmation you get. It doesn't matter how many awards you can put on your shelf, how many possessions you you tend to stockpile. Nothing can substitute for God in your life. So the number one answer to our fears is just this. It's Jesus. For Jesus came out of the empty tomb on Easter so many years ago so that he could fill our empty hearts today with his forgiveness and with his love. And isn't that where we started with all this, with Paul's words? There is no fear in love. God bless you guys. Let me pray. God, we love you so much, and we just pray as we go through this time. There's so many things that are competing in, in our minds right now. There's a worry about the future and how we... I don't know, walk out of this confinement period of time with this coronavirus. There's a fear of um, unemployment or there's a fear of employment and what does that look like on the other side of this after taking so much time off? There, there's a fear of, 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 of maintaining relationships. Either we've spent so much time with them that we've irritated each other or, or we've spent so much time with them that we're really realizing that, that we're still far apart or, and it's causing us angst and it's causing us fear that, that those things won't continue. Sometimes it's just the fear of health, isn't it? Coronavirus is supposed to be pretty serious on elderly, pe- elderly adults, and so especially if you're in that age category, you're worried about how this might affect. You're, you're hoping they find, I, I find a vaccine soon. And anyway, you, you got all these things that are going around in your minds right now, and it's causing you angst, and it's causing you fear, and it's causing you stress, because in those moments that we're doing all of that, we forget the truth that God's got us, that he loves us so much, that our future is already secured, that our, whether that be in eternity or in the next part of our life, that he still has purpose for us, that he will give us strength to overcome every adversity, that he loves you. And so again, it seems like my resounding theme in all my prayers as we go through this, but help us remember, because these are words to live by. They're words that give us peace and health. They are words that restore our spirit and hope. And there are words that remind us of just how much God loves us. So do not fear. And all God's people said, amen. Guys, go with this blessing today. May our Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious always unto you. And may he look upon you now with his favor and grant you forever his peace. And all God's people said, amen. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart. Before I lift my cares, I will lift my arms.
peace and serve the Lord. We'll see you guys next Sunday.